I'm here in London at a low carb and general health event which was organized by the Brazilian doctors and dietitians. So these guys have come all the way from Brazil for this and Dr. Simon Hatro spoke here also. And one of the chief guys amongst these Brazilian docs is Dr. Jose Carlos uh, Suto. Soto. Suto. Okay, delighted to meet you finally. Glad to meet you too. Excellent. And we had a Twitter relationship, shall we say, for many years, sharing science and papers. And uh, now we get to speak face to face. So today, uh, Jose, I just want to talk a fairly brief interview about a couple of key things. One key thing is, you know, there are so many millions of people out there who are not overweight, who are not smokers, who are not clearly uh, metabolically deranged. And yet these people uh, are still exposed to sudden heart attacks and all manner of diseases. So I want to talk about what's the best way to identify middle-aged people who have really significant disease uh, beyond just blood tests which are fallible. Yeah. Uh, the problem with the blood tests is uh, when they are very altered, you know, like in people with metabolic syndrome, people that are really sick, then yeah, the blood tests will give you some hint what what is happening uh, but for those people that you are describing the CAC score uh, seems to be a much better predictor than simple blood tests yes and actually I noticed you referred to it in your talk today actually and showed the risk multipliers that for a zero score in the calcification scan CAC in 10 years you've got around a 1% chance of having a heart event but for a very high score like over a thousand you can have a 37% chance so it's kind of the ultimate measure of your actual internal health and um, it doesn't get used as much as it should I think for political and other reasons in the past uh, is it used much in Brazil do you think? Uh, it is not used much and it's not used nearly as much as it should but you can order it and the insurance companies usually will pay for it. So it is not used, but uh, it's probably because most doctors don't think of ordering it. They just base their decisions on blood markers. Ah, like cholesterol and the classics, and not even blood glucose or insulin, as you discussed today. Yes, blood glucose, yes. It's part of the general checkup that they will uh, ask for the patients. But insulin is very rarely measured. Yeah, I think that's common worldwide pretty much. It's something that will probably change. I think both those things, the calcification scan is going to get big in the coming decade. And I think more testing of insulin also will, will get pretty big, I think. Oh, I, I hope so. <laughs> um, as for uh, the CAC score, uh, it can also be used in the other way around, which is to uh, give peace of mind for those patients that have a high LDL level. But, uh, you know, those are people that are, uh, as you said, they're fit, the, they're not overweight, they don't have metabolic syndrome. And sometimes you just order a CAC score and it comes zero. And you can reassure those patients that they are in a very low uh, risk for heart disease, even though their uh, LDL may be high. Exactly, yeah. So it's reassuring to people who believe that they're healthy, but their cholesterol metrics are not ideal. Um, it's an excellent uh, result. Uh, also the CAC for tracking your progress if you've got a score of say 800 and you then take action because you wake up and you realize there's a problem uh, you take action for a few years watch your bloods and then you can go and get another quick scan and see that the score has not risen that you've been successful but I think that's really useful as well and if someone let's say gets a high score and obviously that's a major concern uh, what are the top things you would do having a high calcification score clearly with diabetic or other dysfunction and heart disease what are the top four or five things you do in your life given that up to that point you've just been eating the food pyramid well I would first of all get rid of the food pyramid <laughs> and go for real food okay so real food getting rid of the processed food especially the processed carbs so a low carb diet if the patient has insulin resistance and at least a lower carb diet if the patient doesn't have insulin resistance but a low uh, processed food diet definitely uh, i think exercise is also something important even though uh, as we now say often uh, you cannot outrun a bad diet 
but exercise will obviously help you. Um, then there's, I think, one you mentioned in your talk today, the vegetable oils that are supposedly heart healthy. Exactly. Uh, we now have uh, randomized controlled trial evidence that these supposedly heart healthy oils are actually uh, capable of giving you more heart attacks and more uh, myocardial infarction. Uh, so uh, even though your cholesterol may go down, you actually get more heart disease because they are inflammatory, right? right? And inflammation is actually something big when we are talking about heart risk disease. Yeah, and I think the vegetable oils, they, they move a marker for some bureaucrat to be happy with, but the long-term implications. I think as well, some of the early trials in vegetable oils showed over a year or two, uh, short-term slight benefit in events, but the reality is over longer periods, the damage will grow and grow. So the long-term outcome is terrible. Um, processed food, I like uh, to hear you say, Jose, because a lot of people say, oh, you're low-carb zealots. And I think some people go overboard on low-carb, high fat with, with loading on butter and, and guzzling too many fats. Uh, whereas if we step back from it, if you just cut out all processed carbs and sugars and all processed foods with vegetable oils, to be honest, you get a long way towards recovering your health, I think. Uh, I completely agree. Uh, and I think the pendulum has gone too far to the side of the high fat. Mm. So uh, low carb, yes. Low processed food, yes. It is higher in fat than the average food pyramid diet that people have been eating. But we are talking about the fat that is naturally present in real food. So if you are eating a salmon, for example, you are eating a high-fat fish, but it's not the same thing as putting butter in your coffee, right? Mm. Or the heavy double cream on everything and all that kind of stuff. I agree, if you take in healthy fats, avocado, fish, and grass-fed, you know, healthy animals that you eat, the fats come in with the good proteins, and it's, it's real food, and you're shunning the breads, and all the junk carbohydrate processed foods and vegetable oils, put that together along with getting sun exposure, exercise, and maybe magnesium and other critical minerals, and you could transform your health very quickly. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And then you can track your progress with something like the CAC score. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If you have big disease, maybe a couple of years later, and if you have a lucky zero, keep doing the what we say <laughs> and then maybe seven or eight or nine years later you could check because you know you're in a really good shape on the first score excellent well any other things to add Jose or I think we've covered the top four or five things there for your health yeah I would add uh, as, uh, as we are talking about the CAC score that people should differentiate between surrogate markers stuff like you know cholesterol uh, that supposedly will tell you risk and the CC score which is a uh, actually you are measuring the disease you are measuring the actual disease in the coronary arteries so that's why it's more predictive because you are actually measuring what you want to measure excellent and as we say if you don't measure it it don't get fixed and calcification is certainly a great example of that kind of test excellent Hey, thanks a lot, Jose. Thank you Great very much. Day. Thank you.